Hey, we're here with Gary Hoey. How you doing, Gary? Doing great, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. So you're out on your uh, annual December Ho Ho Hoey tour, huh? Yes, this Very is cool. the season. <laughs> it is the season. Yeah. Man, this has been a really cool franchise for you. All the all the Christmas classics and, and getting out there, you get a lot, a lot of radio airplay from it. And a lot of bookings. Yeah, it's, well, it's amazing. It's actually going to be 20 years next year that we've been doing it. So certainly we've got a lot out of it, you know. Um, but it's been uh, it's been a great labor of love. I totally love doing the holiday stuff. It was kind of a happy accident when it originally happened, and just to have it be 20 almost 20 years later, it, it's it's a phenomenon, really. Mm -hmm. And three is it three albums? We did. We did a Ho Ho Hoy one, two, and three. Then we had a best of, and then we. After the best stuff, we did a complete collection where we put everything on a double disc, which is what we've been selling for a while now, mm -hmm. uh, the double disc. And I know a lot of people, especially in the U.S. at least, around this time of year, you're hearing the songs on their classic rock radio stations, their, their rock radio stations and all that. We hear it here in Chicago quite often. Places, yeah, we, yeah, we got a lot like of airplay. Yeah. Yes, we got a lot of airplay. And you know, what's interesting is when I did it in 1995, it was the year before Trans-Siberian Orchestra came out. And it was kind of a little bit before like Mary Axmas and all these other guitar Christmas albums. So I was kind of one of the first to really take Christmas arrangements and really kind of rock them in a way where, where I took it further than the original song. So when it got to the radio stations, they, they, you know, they didn't really have good bumper music when they're coming back from breaks and things and to play that and to use for commercials and stuff. So it filled a void that I had no idea of and, uh, and it ended up being a great thing. And now every year I do charity events, I do Christmas stuff. and. Uh, it's good, and we've sold a bunch of copies, you know, and uh, we've helped out a lot of people along the way. Very cool. And uh, besides that, though, uh, you do all kinds of playing, obviously. You're a master of many talents and many styles. Um, most recent album was a blues record, right? Yes. And uh, But I've also heard you do plenty of surf music and, and all kinds of shredder type stuff, you know. Yes. People, people uh, uh, probably know, you know, your skills are, are pretty intense, so. So what you, all kinds of stuff. What what are you uh, what are you working on these days at home? I know you have a home studio and you have that whole thing going on. What are you working on these days? Uh, in the studio, I have a, I'm working on a new a new album. You know, because Deja Blues has been a couple years now. That's been out of the blues record. So I've been accumulating a bunch of new songs. So that's in the works. Mm -hmm. uh, another, another bluesy project. Yeah, another blues record, man. I'm going to cool. stay with it, and, and I may fuse a little more rock in this one and mix it up a little bit. But, you know, I, I've done so many records in different styles and the blues just feels like something I can kind of grow into and enjoy for the next several years. I'll obviously do different projects. Um, it's also been a long time since I've had another holiday record because, you know, we've really been going a long time on the same music. So I started messing around with some songs for a new Christmas record and everybody's saying, you know, are there any songs that you haven't done? Because <laughs> I've done almost 40 songs. But there's a few I haven't, and we're going to change it up a little, maybe do some bluesy versions of some stuff. So next year I'll have a new holiday record. Very cool. And it'll mark the 20th anniversary, so it'll be kind of good to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, when you play these shows, like at this time of year, are you just doing the holiday stuff? No, we mix it up. Okay. We mix it up. We do, you know, we come out with the Christmas stuff, and, you know, we might do, uh, you know, something like, you know... You know, we'll do a little drummer boy, but we kind of do a little bit more like, you know. You know we kind of add a little bit of a Zeppelin feel, and then I, you know, I'll do the octaves, you know. Kind of do that thing, and then we always tend to do, like, I might take a simple Christmas melody, like something, you know, like, you know. And then I'll throw in, you know, so you get this heavy riff mixed with the, with the melody. And that was sort of the, the way that I was able to kind of make it still cool for myself to play it. And uh, I'm tuned down actually a half step right now. And, okay. and, and a low, my low E string is drawn down to the low D. So that's why it sounds kind of low. So some of the, some of the Christmas stuff I do in, in a drop, drop tuning. Mm -hmm. What uh, gauge strings do you have? Uh heavier gauge? Uh, not really. I just, you know, I used, I was using 10 through 52s mm -hmm. for a really long time. And um, I, now I'm just using a straight 10 set. You know, I grew up with nines. I used to use nines for a really long time. And so I like lighter strings. I just, they feel a little slinkier and I can kind of bounce between like doing pull-offs and other things. Mm -hmm. If I was doing like a straight blues, I might go a little heavier, but uh, mm -hmm. to, to mix it up, I like the lighter strings. Mm -hmm. So this guitar, uh, 
uh, reverse headstock and all that. Is this is this been your main guitar for a while? I have a few. This one I use a lot for the drop tuning because when I got the lefty headstock, I just thought it was like cool looking like Jimi Hendrix and everything. But then I found out that it does make the bass strings a lot longer. Yeah. So you do end up kind of with a heavier um, tone. So because okay. it's not a locking tremolo, we're getting some of the, the sound out of that. So, yeah. um, so it tends to give it a really nice... tends to be just beefier it really rumbles the amp a little more so yeah. this has become like my stock whenever I'm drop tuning it's this one you know cool. so you're not drop tuning through the whole show no uh, the first several songs we do this and then I switch to another guitar that I'm using on the tour um, mm -hmm. that's that's um, not doesn't have the drop and, and it's uh, and I've got uh, the Fishman fluence pickups which is the new uh, yeah new pickups I've been using and that guitar I'm using tonight yeah, okay. Yeah, Greg Koch told me about those. Yes, they're very good pickups. They're, yeah. really, they're really cool. There's no windings, there's no copper windings, but yet they have a really thick sound, really beautiful dynamic range, uh -huh. and you can turn the volume down and you don't lose any of the high end. It stays with you all the way. Huh. So it's, it's, it's really sweet. Yeah, sound. completely new style of pickup. It is, it is. It's a very new technology, but it, it, bottom line is it sounds great. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's the bottom line. They yeah. sound really good. Yeah, how'd you get turned on to those? Fishman is in Andover, Massachusetts, and I'm living in New Hampshire now, so they were only 15 minutes from my house. I see. So we were fr we've been friends over the years, but when they were in development, they asked me if I'd come over and lend my ears to them, and I said, yeah. So I showed up, and they said, wait, do you hear these new pickups? And I was like, oh, uh, sure. You know, and they made me sign a you know, paper of confidentiality, or you know, they took a blood sample, pulled a piece <laughs> of hair out of my head, and then I gave it a listen, and I was like, where's the, where's the smoke and mirrors? I was yeah. blown away. Yeah, very cool. So you've got those on one guitar right now? Yes, yeah, yeah tonight. I gotta come on a couple, but okay. tonight one of the guitars that's on tour with me has got them in it, and, and it sounds beautiful, you'll, yeah. you'll hear it. Yeah, so what are you playing through, what kind of effects? On this tour, I'm using the EVH amps, which I've been using for a very long time. Um, Fender manufactures the EVH amp, which I've been working with Fender for about 19 years now. So the new Eddie Van Halen 3 is just a phenomenal amplifier. Really sounds just really beefy, and, and I run, um, a delay and a reverb in the loop so it gives it a nice clean sound and, and I never run my delay or reverb in with all my other pedals because it, it definitely kind of cloudies it up so I put them in the loop and then I use it just a regular crybaby wah I have a, a few a couple distortion pedals that I'm using a rocktron pedal that I designed called the intimidator uh, distortion box and um, I've got uh, a couple others um, I got a flanger that I'm using just on a couple of tunes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good, really good sounding one. It's the one Howard Lee's design, the Tone Works or something. It's called the Barracuda. Mm -hmm. But Howard from, from Howard Heart. From Heart. Howard mm -hmm. Lee from Heart. Yeah, he, uh, he turned me on to it and it's the best sounding flange I've ever heard. Cool. Yeah. Can you explain why you would run something through your effects loop and not through your pedal board? Yeah, you know, it, it's what it is is, you know, all the, mo the modulation effects, you know, things like delay reverb, chorus, flanger, those kind of effects when they're run to a multiple of pedals you know with with a tube screamer and all these other things what happens is those things start to feed the reverb and the delay in the pedal and it tends to sometimes like I used to grow up doing that and then my delays would go whoop, 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 and they would just get all out of control but yet while I played the lead I couldn't really hear the delay and then as soon as I stopped playing the delay would seem to go out of control and it was because it, it because the distortion was masking the delay while it was happening whereas when you put it in the loop it, it almost steps into like the studio world where the distortion and the preamp on the front of the amp with all the effects and not effects but distortion and, and gain and treble and bass and all that that gets its own separate sound and then the loop allows the reverb and delay to be almost masked in the background sitting as if somebody on the mixing board just went up and turned up some effects so that they're not actually destroying the heart of the sound. I see. And it gives it a lot more depth and a lot more dimension mm -hmm. and the delays just sound much cleaner, you know, mm -hmm. while you're actually soloing. It kind of gives you that little ambience of sound. Now, are they on all the time then? No, I have them, I have them on my pedal board and I, and I bring oh. them on and off. Okay. But, you know, you can do it either way. But what I do is I run, um, I run a snake with, you know, three cables, yeah. one for the send and return that goes to the pedal board and to the head. So whatever modulation effects are on the board will be in that chain of loop. And then uh, the rest of the effects will just be going in and out the guitar to the amp. I see. Okay. You know, so just you have to run a, a couple extra cables in your in your chain mm -hmm. uh, to make it happen, but mm -hmm. it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the pedal you designed. 
Well, I've designed a couple of distortion pedals. I did one with another company, Rocktron wanted to do one, and this one I wanted it to be just really over the top, like super dirty and just almost a bit metal, you know, because mm -hmm. the other one I did was really nice and, you know, tasty, and I didn't want this to be tasty. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be like really nasty, like you step on it and it's just like, get out of the way. I'm sustained for days and I'm jumping out over the band mm -hmm. <laughs> instantly. And that was my goal, you know? So I kind of took a little bit of the Distortion Plus, which was the old MXR thing. Yeah and a rat pedal yeah. and I said guys just smash these together and make something out of it and, yeah. and that sort of sounds and um, we went a couple revisions of it you know yeah. but uh, it's got bass and treble gain and volume mm -hmm. and it has a, a control called punish <laughs> which is you know punishes the sound a little bit more <laughs> yeah so who's it from Rocktron okay and it's, called it? the, it's called the Intimidator okay the Intimidator not, I'm not a very intimidating person but <laughs> <laughs> my pedal is there you go there you go <laughs> So and so, what are we uh, in, in the show tonight? You're you're playing like are you are you playing all the different genres that you've covered in the past? Are we gonna hear a little surf, a little blues? A little bit, yeah. We're yeah. gonna mix it up, you know. A we're gonna bit do, of metal. Yep, we're gonna do some blues. We do some Christmas. We, we'll definitely there'll be a little bit of metal in there. Some more shredding here and there, you know. Yeah. Because there's always certain songs that people want to hear, you know. The, the fans that they email me and they send me messages like, "Are you gonna play this song tonight? You're gonna play this song?" And if enough people say it, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, so you know, and the Christmas stuff. They, anybody likes your mean one, Mr. Grinch, and you know some yeah. of the heavier things, um, and then the blue stuff. We'll we'll do a few things off the news, the new record, and then of course we got to do Hocus Pocus because mm -hmm. you know if they don't hear this riff, you know it's like. You know, it's like they got to hear that riff. Yeah, yeah. Will you will you break those chords down for us? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let me just tune my ears real quick. That's just the coolest little chord progression. Yeah, what, what it is is basically, you know, you get the basic riff. So you got your open A string and the fourth string. You have the open string and then, and then your seventh fret with the fourth double in the A, right? And then coming on and off. And then what you do is you go to E minor, then F major seventh. Okay, so, so seventh fret, you're going to go E minor chord, then move up and just jump those two fingers over. That's going to be F major seventh. And then C major seventh. B flat major seventh and then E seven sharp nine. So it's like Okay, so that's your chords right there. E minor, F major seven. And then the C major seventh is basically like an E minor chord, but just take your first finger and move it down to the C as the bass note now. And that's gonna give you the if the fingering if you don't know it. And then just move that down a whole step. Another B, another form of the B flat major seven, which is kind of like a D minor with a with a B flat on the bass. So again, okay, and then the second time it changes. Now it just goes E F. It goes E F, then D, then B, and here it just does root and fifth. E, F, D, B, E. Okay, so the whole thing. Cool? Cool. All right. Very cool. Thank you. you got so it. I'm wondering uh, just a little bit. From a, I've always been so impressed with your career situation. The way you have... Because you started out in a major label band, and at some point you went off and became your own boss, more or, more or less. Yes. All the instrumental albums, the Christmas albums, the surf albums, all these things. You do a lot of songwriting with other artists, don't you? I know you write with Lita Ford. Yes. And, and others. produce as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. And others. Yep. You, yep. You know? I've written with other people. I also write for ESPN Sports. A lot mm -hmm. of music you hear on ESPN is me. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. And how did you get to that point? How did you pull all that off? Wow, that's a good question. You know, I think a lot of it is just, you know, sticking with it and constantly evolving and changing and growing, you know, because I think as a musician, you know, you can be just a guitar player, you know, or you can be 
a guitar player that also is a songwriter, you know, or a producer, or an engineer, or a mixer, or a guy that's good at certain things. So what I wanted to do was I kind of loved fiddling in the studio, you know, but I never really wanted to own my own studio. I just thought, oh, that's just a big headache. I don't want to own a studio. Um, but then when technology got better and, and Pro Tools came out and you could do it in a laptop, that changed everything. Um, but growing up, I kind of was fascinated with sound. You know, I had a, I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine when I was a teenager and used to make four-track reel-to-reel recordings. So I, I have a long history of, of looking at the red light, you know, and, mm -hmm. and having to record. So that was part of my thing coming up. And um, when I was in the studio working with some great producers that I got to work with, like Jimbo Barton, um, who mixed, you know, Queensryche and, you know, working with people like Richie Zito, who did The Cult and all these bands. and getting to sit near good, great engineers that have worked with everyone from Michael Jackson and, and to other great artists, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I would hang around the studio after everybody went home. I'd be the last guy there, hanging out, asking questions. So it was a little of that. And then, you know, uh, the, 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 if, I think because I was constantly making music, it's like, it's weird in the music business. If you keep producing stuff and you keep writing stuff and stockpiling things, and all of a sudden these opportunities seem to come along where someone says, hey, a guy needs a thing for a thing. And if you have a couple songs laying around, you're halfway there. Or I would get a call, Gary, this guy needs a song, but he needs it by tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I would be the guy that would stay up till seven in the morning, recording it, doing it, redoing it, making it great, and then getting it to FedEx with it before they closed. Even though now we could email it, we can zip file it, but back then we'd be racing to the airport to try to get it on a plane. So I was the guy that you know, never said no. You know, and that's part of, you know, giving yourself a career is, is never saying no, maybe working for a lot of money sometimes, working for little money sometimes, working for no money sometimes. So I don't know if there's a formula I could tell you for what I've done to, you know, sort of succeed in the music business, you know, and, and have a career at least. Um, it has had its ups and downs, I'll be honest with you. You know, in some years we're like, oh man, this is getting tough, you know, because it's a tough business, you know. Yeah. Well, you've, you've done it well, though. It's, it's been a, a long road that I've enjoyed watching. Like, man, he just keeps cranking out albums. He just keeps going on tour. He keeps uh, popping up here and there. Very cool. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I've been able to feed my two kids on rock and roll for 16 years now, and, and that is a testimony in itself. Yes, it and is. Uh, I feel very blessed every day. I really do what I do, and I love what I do, and I definitely treat it with respect. And, and uh, you know, we, I have a good, a good work ethic, you know, growing up in, in, in a mill town, Lowell, Massachusetts. My, my parents taught me, you know, you work hard, you know, and you, and you, and you get in there and you give it everything you got. So. I think that carried on into, into what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool.